I have Rob McLean, founder, CEO, and director of Points International. And he's going to talk about today what it takes and how much it takes in order to be successful of a public company in today's ever-changing environment. Rob, welcome to The Playbook. Great. Thanks, David. I appreciate you having me join. Well, no problem. You know, I think it's so interesting that you have such a big, successful company, but, you know, doing research on you, I found out you believe in one thing to create a successful company, and that's people. Uh, and understanding how important the people are to your business, regardless of how big it gets, how public it gets, where it goes, you still seem to come back to your greatest resource and asset are your people. What have you learned through the years of building companies that makes the people so important, especially in these accelerated times of change? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, you know, I think we think a lot about building a business, uh, which, you know, as a public company, most people um, expect us to. But I think we, we also spend a lot of time thinking about building a company. And, you know, when you start up and for entrepreneurs who, who live this every day, you know, you start a company from scratch. Um, you know, there's a lot of good ideas out there, but a lot of it kind of falls flat on its face. If you don't have great people that either share that passion or that kind of attitude and approach, I just don't think there's any way, um, you know, to get these great ideas off the, off the ground. So, you know, we spend a lot of time you know, trying to find ways to get great people and, and uh, keep them, which is not, you know, not an easy task uh, these days uh, as well. We're kind of still that, that size where you can almost get your arms around the business for 250 to 300 people. So you still have that luxury of being able to kind of bring in just great people as opposed to, um, you know, trying to go out and, and hire and, and bring, you know, large numbers of people in, you know, I, I often say we're still at that size where it's hard to hide a bad apple. Like it, you just, you know, you, you can't hide a, a bad choice. And we make mistakes as well, but we try to avoid that as much as possible. And when, you know, the expense of having a bad apple is exponential to a business, no matter how big or small it is, um, but understanding and fostering your culture within the context of growing, because you are growing quickly and whether you have 100 or 250, it goes to 500 and then to 1,000. You know, what are you looking for uh, in those people when you're recruiting them, when you're interviewing them and when you're onboarding them? Yeah, you, you know, I, I think I always try to keep things simple. Uh, you know, in the early days, you're looking for honest, smart and hardworking. Like I think if you can get some combinations of those, as corny as that sounds, um, it usually works out, uh, you know, you know, for us, we're doing business all over the world. So uh, one of the things that I always find interesting and it just shines anytime you're looking for individuals or doing interviews, you know, if there's a passion there and a curiosity there for the business we're in, um, you know, it's never likely to be a job at that point. It'll, it'll always be a bit of a, 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 a bit more fun. So, you know, we are always looking for somebody who, is a points junkie. We're in the business of buying, selling, and exchanging, uh, earning, redeeming miles and points. So, you know, if you've got that that passion, that interest in the industry, and and finding ways to travel and, and see the world, that's that's always a big add as well. Um, you know, when you're again this size, you you want to have a nice crossover between those professional skills and that personal camaraderie, um, and, and so that kind of shared passion for travel, shared passion for loyalty programs and point points and stuff and, and such is, is, is always a big ad. Yeah. Your uh, point stores, point stirs, as you call them, seem to be happy and fulfilled. Do you believe that within the context of those industries, you know, I'm in the sports and entertainment field and a lot of people just assume, well, yeah, of course, everybody's happy. I actually think it's counterintuitive sometimes that when you have an industry that is more conducive to having fun, like travel and travel points and hospitality, that it actually creates a facade of fun. Uh, and then you have a mismanagement of expectations uh, to not only employees, but to the consumers themselves, that somehow that this is still not a business. How do you balance the fulfillment uh, in passion and curiosity, which are always closely tied to the aspect that, hey, this is still work. And I think, you know, especially with the younger generation, uh, yeah. they, they would uh, prefer to see it as, you know, travel. And yet, you know, this, I call it activity you get paid for. 
And so I say, look, this is activity you get paid for. There's going to be some things you may not like to do. And that's why I'm paying you. If you love to do everything, I probably wouldn't have to pay you. It'd be like playing second base for the Padres for me. They, I would gladly pay them $2 million to allow me to do that. But the guy who does it every day and has to get taped and warmed up and be away from his family 300 days a year, he calls it work. How do you balance uh, that perception of fun and fulfillment with the actual activity they get paid for? Yeah, it, it, I may steal your line there that it's activity you get paid for. I, I think it does some, some of it does go back to um, bringing the right kind of people in. There's no question. It is work, right? It, it is a business. Um, you know, when we, we bring folks in, uh, you don't really have to explain that. I think genuinely uh, people understand that they're coming to help us grow a business and, and grow a company. Um, you know, we do have a good, we have the luxury of having kind of an interesting topic and an interesting premise. So we're working with like wildly smart people all over the world. That adds a little bit of, of kind of energy and, and excitement to the business. Um, you know, we tend to have higher, you know, A types, which has its pluses and minuses. You know, people are always looking to win. The sports analogy is you know, you know, if you're going to be Brady and you're going to keep at it at 43, there's something driving him other than money. Right. Um, and, and I think that is, yeah, well, he, he already married, he already married rich. He didn't need the money <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think you got to look for something else. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a crew of people that just love kind of interacting with the, uh, with the loyalty industry all over the world. They like winning, um, you know, that, that creates environments where, you know, sometimes you got to, um, kind of deal with some um, intensity perhaps, but look, I think that's a good trade-off. If you've got people that are passionate about the business, if they're passionate about winning, then, then they're going to find ways to kind of create that balance as you described In those days when it does feel like work, hopefully there's as many days where it, it feels like um, activity you're getting paid for, as you say. So, I, and I think it, it still all goes back to you kind of find the right kind of people to bring in, that are going to have a bunch of fun when they're they're trying to build a business, but uh, they know it is they know it's work for sure. And Rob, did you have any concerns? I know you have a, a truly office centric environment. You know, you have all types of snacks and you know a typical Silicon Valley environment where you really want people to stay and enjoy each other's company beyond the activity they get paid for to have plenty of opportunity to enjoy the office itself. Uh, but obviously with the pandemic hitting and 250 office centric employees, uh, did you have any concern that the adaptation uh, to the separation would have an exponential effect on your crew comparatively to, you know, other companies that may have already, you know, transformed into a more remote culture? Yeah. So yes is the, the short answer for sure. You know, again, I, well, that makes for a shitty it. interview. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll ask for more of the, <laughs> Yeah, we'll try to fill in some of the blanks. Welcome to Dave Meltzer, the playbook. Yes, yes, and yes. That's a, that, this is why you only see a few. This is a true story, Rob. This is why you only see a few head coaches on the playbook because I've learned, you know, head coaches are trained to say as little as possible when you ask them a question. <laughs> so you do not want like Bill Belichick on the playbook because yeah. his answer would be, don't you think it'd be tough? Yeah. And I'd sit here in silence. At least you're wise enough to like extrapolate on the yes. So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got 15 or 20 minutes to go. Right. So right. Uh, no, you know, look, I, I think it, it's um, uh, the, the, the two paths, right. I, I think probably was less worried about what it would do to the business. Um, you know, again, I, I mentioned our, our partners or our customers are all over the world. So the team is, yeah, they're pretty young and energetic. They're used to working remotely, um, whether you're working with a, with a partner in Dubai or in Chicago or, or in, in Tokyo. So that side of it, I think the team, like, again, have adapted very well, better than I would have thought. Uh, you know, there's still a bit of old school in me. I like that, that uh, ability to kind of see people face to face. But, um, the, you know, the ability to kind of deal with the pandemic challenges from a business standpoint has gone, you know, better than I would have expected. I, I was probably more worried about and continue to be more worried about uh, and concerned about or challenged with whatever you want to say on the company building side of it, because that that is just so hard to replicate. You know, that time you spend hanging around with people you respect, you know, both professionally and personally, 
the learning that just happens, you know, in hallways and in, in uh, on, on the on the road, uh, that isn't structured in a you know some stupid policy document, uh, but is actually learned when you're out there in front of a customer or you're learning from from somebody who's sitting beside you that's been you know in the business for a few years. That that part of it is definitely harder uh, for sure. I, I would say we we work hard at it. Uh, Again, it's a pretty young crew uh, around here, so their adaptability, resilience is 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 pretty impressive. Um, but you, you know, you do have you do have to work at at that. And I, I I do think the longer this goes on, the harder it gets. I'm not sure what new normal is. Um, I'm not sure I'm all that interested in learning what the new normal is when it comes to you know working out of your home office. Um, but I, I, again, I think generally if people are having fun with the, the work they're doing and still have an opportunity to kind of interact with some smart, uh, smart people, you know, that's carrying us a long way, but, uh, boy, I, I think we're all, we're all looking forward to getting back to some version of an office environment where we can get to hang out with, with each other a little bit more. Cause it, it is a big part of us and, and, and a lot of other companies experience, I suspect. You know, beyond the mental health side of it and the mindset side, which you obviously seem to have been concerned and your team has really responded, what about the physical challenges? You know, when you're looking at having a younger workforce and, you know, I have found through, because I have a younger workforce as well, you know, bonusing, uh, you know, fitness equipment has been one of my favorite things to do. Uh, you know, Pelotons and mirrors, if I can find them, have been great gifts uh, to younger people that need to physically stay active. Have you been able to stay or maintain or inspire the younger workforce to remain active even through the pandemic? Yeah, you know, we so we do try to, to be as creative as possible. You know, we've been lucky enough We've won a number of awards as kind of great places to work and top employers in the country. And, um, you know, I, I always think we've gotten a couple where we've been recognized in terms of how we've um, uh, um, worked with the technology community and then more recently with the millennial community. And I just wonder, like, what, is, what is an award to work with the millennials about? Uh, I, I do think it really just comes down to flexibility. Uh, you know, a couple of things. I mean, flexibility is a big part of it. We, you know, we do have, uh, as you might expect, uh, incentives and credits for people for their, you know, fitness, and and uh, we do do the snack carts and all that kind of good stuff that you'd expect. Uh, green commute, and, and it is one of the things that that surprised me, um, perhaps as things have evolved, that. As, as more of this, these, these younger folks have joined points, um, it's not been in a structured way, but there's been a really powerful sense that that group of new, new uh, employees, they wanna see the company actually engage in, in do good things, you know, with the community in terms of charities, in terms of, uh, you know, not just, you know, try to hit everything to the bottom line, but how do you, how do you actually participate uh, externally with the community and charities and, and doing some good things. And, you know, we haven't done it in a very structured way. It's been largely driven by a lot of our, our kind of younger and, and uh, more aware employees on that, from that standpoint. And it's been, it's been really kind of interesting to see them create that part of the culture around here uh, because it's important to them, right? It's as important to them as you know, fitness benefits or getting them the Peloton, et cetera. I think they really want to uh, feel like they're working with a company that, uh, you know, pardon the expression, but gives a shit about, um, you know, people in the community outside, outside points. So, you know, that, that's been kind of fun to watch. And, uh, you know, when in some ways we, you know, they say you want to lead, but I think on stuff like that, we've had better experience just kind of getting out of their way, letting them kind of set that pace uh, for, for us at the, at the company. So it's been fun. Yeah, but parting the expression, right? You're in the we give a shit business because I think you know loyalty programs themselves were predicated upon people who were loyal uh, and spending a fortune with you know bigger companies uh, and to get that appreciation recognition that hey, we give a shit about you yeah. uh, coming coming with us. And you've worked with some great companies, re really big integrated loyalty programs, and we learn so much. I always said. One of the best lessons I learned, I, I worked for West Publishing out of law school, uh, which had the first natural language search engine. Uh, you know, it was a, a closed environment in DOS in the early days of 92, the internet. But I learned how important it was to have word 
word searches. And so when I started doing videos years ago, I transcribed everything to have a word backing to it because I knew if I was eventually as successful as I thought I would be or dreamed of being, that it would really help be helpful to have every video transcribed so you could search my videos. And I have like the Dave Meltzer search engine. What lesson did you take away, you know, being so long involved and integrated in these loyalty programs? What's like the big lesson that you took away that you have applied to uh, the points uh, business that you're in today? Well, I, I think a couple, couple of things that were important early on that wasn't all that well understood outside the industry, excuse me. And that, that's just the, one, the size and scale of loyalty. I think, you know, in America, if you're in a loyalty program, you know, these days you're, you're carrying 25 to 30 cards, right? You're in a few airline programs, you're in hotel programs, you're in a, you know, grocery and gas, uh, you're probably in some sports programs and co-branded credit card programs as well. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that was interesting early on was, uh, you know, as anybody starting a business, you're trying to get a sense for, is there a big market history? Um, and so from the inside, you could kind of see uh, just how many members there were and, and kind of the economic engine underpinning it. A lot of that isn't as visible from the outside uh, to consumers. So for me, it was, this just looks like a, something that might stick, right? There's, you know, we work today with uh, between 800 million and a billion uh, customers in these loyalty programs that ha are, uh, are just growing every day, right? It's, it's just, it's staggering. When you're United Airlines, you have, you're approaching a hundred million um, uh, members in that loyalty program. It's, it's crazy, right? So. So, you know, a big market was something that was important in starting a company um, that, you know, you'd, you'd give yourself at least an opportunity to work in, a, in an environment that, that had lots of legs and was going to continue to grow. So that, that was important. I think the second thing was, you know, there's a really a business underpinning these, uh, these loyalty programs. And most of us, you know, when we're going to, to see a ball game or, or, or whatever, we're traveling you know, we get that free seat, we use our miles or use our points. Um, and so there's a little bit of, hey, I got this for free. You know, why is the airline giving me this for free? Or why is the hotel giving me the, the room? Um, but like everything, uh, nothing's free. Uh, they actually have found a way, these big loyalty programs to, um, you know, offer that uh, free seat or free bed because they've sold miles to the end of it, or to, to companies like Citibank or Chase or others that offer those to you as a consumer to do some type of a transaction. So it, it's not a, a philanthropic exercise, which sometimes it feels like from the outside that, uh, you know, all these free miles and, and points, uh, free hotels, free flights, it really is a, a pretty big economic engine underneath these loyalty programs. And that was a surprise I think to a lot of our investors, to a lot of people outside that, you know, yes, it's a big market, but it's also a market that's fundamentally built on uh, strong economics. So, you know, those were things that we've tried to build on as we've, we've grown the company. Uh, you know, if we can make money for the loyalty programs, if we can kind of give kind of cool ideas and things to do for members to kind of engage with, then, you know, we can have a bit of fun along the way. That, that all feels pretty good. Well, Rob, I certainly appreciate all the great points that you give us inside and outside of the playbook. Thank you so much for coming on.